Well, hello and welcome. This is a big one. We are celebrating 16 podcasts with a special guest. I want to welcome to the show uh, founder and principal of Cars and Bids. This is Blake Machado. Blake, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Pleasure to be here. It's going to be fun. We're going to talk cars. We're going to talk watches. But first, I got to ask you, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Were you a car enthusiast or a watch enthusiast first? That is an excellent question. Um, You know, it's funny. I, I owned watches before I owned cars, obviously. So... I remember the first watch I got, my dad, he worked at a um, manufacturing job in the electronics industry, and he had got a branded watch for his company. It was like a Timex, like cheapo little uh, quartz watch. Uh, And so I got that watch. I remember wearing it around. And I've always liked watches, but definitely the passion for me started with cars. Uh, You know, I I grew up watching uh, Ghostbusters, uh, Back to the Future. And for me as a kid, those were like the pinnacle vehicles. And that really launched me into cars. Then I had this amazing uncle who had all the fast cars, uh, muscle cars and accurate and exercise growing up. And I was just like, that's, that's for me. So, so it started with cars, uh, but I've always appreciated watches, but I don't think I got into watches as like an enthusiast until a little bit later in life, a little bit more recently. That's a cool story because it's a, it's very similar to mine. I remember I had kind of the cheap quartz watch when I was a kid, only for me, it was Armatron. Armatron. Nice. A multifunction armatron. It had a little, it wasn't an, it wasn't like Indiglo. It had a little LED light in there that would light about <laughs> half the time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Back to the Future, Herbie the Love Bug, Ghostbusters. I mean, who, who could ever forget the 1959 Cadillac ambulance? I, right. I had affection for those for years and I never knew where it came from. Then I went back, I saw Ghostbusters again. I'm like, oh. Oh, here it is. Exactly. I still, I still debate, you know, as a kid, my dream was to then have one of those cars, like recreate one of those cars. And that dream's faded a little bit, but it's still there. So I still wonder if I'll ever get back to that when I have some time. There's a new, there's a new Ghostbusters movie coming out. I saw the trailer and it's yeah. got in it. I'm like, my heart skipped a beat there. You never say never. So never say never. Uh, tell me a bit about cars and bids. Everyone knows bring a trailer, mm-hmm. but there is a difference in focus. And I think you're coming to this from a different place. Tell us how the two are different, cars and bids versus bring a trailer. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, which, which most people ask. So for those who aren't familiar really quick, both are auction websites for cool vehicles, right? Uh, for people to buy and sell cars. So, you know, our focus at cars and bids really speaks to um, the era that I grew up in, my interest, um, which is to say 80s, 90s, 2000s cars, uh, you know, there's, that's a growing segment. I think there's a growing market. There's people like us, people our age, Tim, who are, you know, they're getting a little bit older. They're maybe getting a little bit nostalgic. They've got some, some money in their pocket. Um, and it's just a fun segment. And we felt like there was an opportunity to really focus in on that and build a product for that younger, a little bit more technologically savvy demographic and try to just build a really great experience around buying and selling cool, interesting, weird cars from that era. And so we've tried to focus in on that segment, uh, build a really great product, um, you know, meet the expectations people have today. It's gotta be really fast. You can just do it all digitally. You're just chatting with us. Um, So our focus is probably the primary difference. And then we have a bunch of little innovations in terms of the feature set and how you go about it. We try to, again, make it really, really fast end to end for sellers and for buyers. And you'll, you'll see us continue to innovate further um, as we try to both add transparency into the marketplace and, you know, uh, reduce friction with the, the transaction process, try to just make the transactions easier for buyers and sellers. But the core focus and demographic, I think, is the, is the key driver there. I remember I was trying to explain the difference at one point to a friend. I'm like, the cars are the high school dream cars of Gen Xers and millennials. Yes. In a nutshell. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and there's cars that, like, I forgot about. And they come back and I'm like whoa, these things still exist, you know, and you see cars and people who, it's funny to see people who don't, aren't as familiar, didn't grow up in that era. They're just like, why are, you know, why are, why is this an interesting car? Um, But for us, we look at it and we just think exactly back to those days. uh, And it's fun to get to relive, relive the past a little bit and, you know, play with these things in sort of uh, a modern day setting. I would also say this kind of the speculative fun. I mean, everyone knows that a 1973 Porsche 911 RS 2.7 is it's a million dollar car now. Everyone understands that if you've got a four speed with a Hemi and it's matching numbers, you're now a rich man. But I think there's a fun to trying to spot tomorrow's classics before absolutely. they get that level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
you know, one of the things we have is, is community, right? We have a big community of enthusiasts and there's never ending debate about like, is this a great, on a, like every car that sells inevitably, there's somebody who's like, what, why is someone paying this for this? And then there's another person like, this is an amazing deal. Just watch this thing go, you know? And it's fun to get to have those conversations and see, honestly see those trends take place uh, in, in the market. And, and these are, this, is, this is generally the price points we're talking about. Most of our cars are sub 60,000, although we do have some exotic stuff and more expensive stuff. Yeah, they're cars you can have fun with. You know, they're cars that are meant to be, to be driven and, and enjoyed and used. You know, one thing I've noted about, you know, both your website, Bring a Trailer, is that compared to the previous generation of auto auctions, which were either, you know, just thousands of auctions in the desert by a major auction house or eBay Motors, uh, there's a lot more onboard community with common threads, people who are regulars, experts who mm -hmm. are for opinion. They're not buying anything, but they're part of a community. How do you cultivate that, the buyers and then the people who are there just to participate? Yeah, you know, it's something we've been, we've been trying to, we knew in the very beginning, I should say, um, you know, we launched with uh, a big personality uh, in the car world to help us do that. He's my co-founder, my partner, Doug DeMiro, and he brings a community inherently, which is amazing. And so we knew we had this community, um, but the question was, yeah, how are we going to cultivate it and, and, and really grow and mature? And I think the truth is we're still figuring that out. One thing that's been interesting is we tried to, we tried to build some fun into the product from the get-go. Um, and we, 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 we didn't want to take ourselves too seriously. And one of the things we did is we just made the process really fast. So the bidding process is super real time. And the, you know, we extend time as you get into that last minute, it keeps resetting to just one minute. So it moves along pretty quick and it can be really engaging. Um, we, we actually in testing, we're like, we, we realized that there was some fun to be had here. And we, we introduced some features to support that. And you see, you see the community engaging because of that, which is great. And, you know, it's interesting. We've had people who have been, you know, commenters on almost every auction. And you're just like, okay, well, that's cool. They're here, they're participating, but that's probably their participant level. Um, but we've seen some of them go on to bid and buy a car. And so you just, you just never know. So we're trying to be really inclusive. You know, when we think about community, it's trying to figure out, well, how do we um, obviously support our customers, the buyers and sellers, but also continue to let these other people participate and engage and feel like they're a part of something, even if they can't afford that cool car they're watching sell, uh, you know, right before their very eyes. Uh, definitely. And I think that's important because I love reading the comments on on cars and bids. For, for me, the, the final sale price is interesting, but getting there and the comment threads, I've lost hours reading those. So it's, yes, it's almost like we, the old articles on car and driver. You just read them. Yeah, no, it's fun. It's really fun to watch. Uh, and it's really the stories that come out, the information that comes out about cars. Uh, it's 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 fun. And you do feel like you're you're a part of something. Um, you know, I, I've never actually had the privilege of going to an in-person auction, but I feel like it's just, you're just sort of sitting there silently watching or you're participating and that's, that's it. You're on either end of the spectrum. Um, but with a platform like ours, everyone can participate and you, you get, you get that sense that it's actually fun and the room has something to say. And it's, it's for most people, it's a very enjoyable experience. So, you know, disruptive technology and whatnot, what happens to traditional auction houses? I mean, when you get to the point where you can go on an auction site and in seven days you can sell mm -hmm. a million dollar car with a capped premium for the buyer. Yeah, much lower fees, yep. Who's gonna buy an $800,000 car at auction and then have to pay the house 20%? What happens in the future? Do auctions move entirely onto online platforms like this? You know, it's a great question. And, and truth be told, obviously, I don't know the answer, but I have a couple of thoughts. One is um, the, every, the auctions are moving more and more online. I think, I mean, the COVID has forced all of these auction houses to start to figure out, well, how do we, take you know online auctions more seriously um i don't think any of them are ready to give up in-person auctions but they're obviously trying to adapt um but the truth of that you know answer i'm going to steal this this is from uh jerry seinfeld who i'm a big fan of i don't know him personally but he's he he's always said and i think this is a really good point there's at some point rich guys just want to be in a room together now this was a pre-covid comment but i do think there is there is something fun about all the events that go with an auction coming together it's a trip you get to go out there and do and so that part is cool um, for a segment of people who want to do that, who have the time to do that, who are invested in that kind of experience. Um, but in terms of just the practical realities of buying and selling, I just think more and more things are going to move online. And definitely, especially when the, the cost of the buyer's premium is capped at, I mean, once you start talking about six figures, it's almost negligible. I think you charge 5%. It's capped at four and a half. 
So it's capped at 4,500 bucks. Yeah, so it, it is negligible. When you get to super expensive cars, I mean, the, the, the buyer's fee becomes just an incredibly small percentage. Uh, and then we don't have a seller's fee. So for sellers, you know, a lot of these auctions, the sellers are also paying some sort of premium or fee on top of uh, and above. So it's a much more economical way to do it. It's much easier. But, you know, there's a segment of people who grew up or they've been going to auctions. It's how they do it. You know, it's, these things always take time, of course. And, we'll, and I'm sure the big auction houses, they're smart. They'll, they'll try to adapt and they'll continue to adapt. But I, I definitely think it's moving online and it's been accelerated with COVID. And one thing that's been consistent between watches and cars, certainly in 2021, and it's been shocking, but there's been a surge in the price of luxuries and the demand, the average selling price of units and the number of dollars chasing scarce stuff. What's going on right now? with cars i mean prices on everything are surging what's happening it's going up it's going up i mean that is a great question uh here's what i will say i will say firstly yeah there's a broader economic market effect something going on yes fewer dollar or more dollars chasing fewer goods i mean everything's just getting more and more expensive uh you know i, I i'm always, there's a few watches i'm always watching and i just wish i had bought them months ago and <laughs> i'm just really kicking myself right now we'll get to that but um you know supplies are all-time lows for used cars right now. So dealers are, they're having trouble keeping their lots filled. Like they, they getting, just getting moving inventory, not even making money, just making sure they have inventory. It's really hard right now. So supplies are super low. Um, new car manufacturing was impacted by COVID. There's been this whole chip shortage. So there's fewer new cars moving out. Uh, new cars are getting more and more expensive. And I just think all those things are culminating uh, together to create, yeah, uh, just an upward trending market, especially in certain pockets, um, and especially at the lower end of the market, you're just, you, the, the cheap stuff is really starting to rise. The lower end of the collectible market, the affordable end is just coming straight up right now. Uh, it's interesting where it goes. I don't know. Cars, you know, they peaked a few years ago, like 2016, the collector car market was like up here. It kind of came back down to reality and now it's off to the races along with everything else. So I don't know, your guess is as good as mine. Where are watches going? Are my it's watches just say. getting less uh, affordable for me or what? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope you want Parmigiani because, you know, Rolex, Patek, Audemars Piguet. Yeah. It's very deep and very narrow here. Like, I see cars almost regardless. If it's a manual transmission right now, it's going crazy. I see yeah. unsold cars and the price that's being asked for an unsold car keeps going up. That's the opposite yeah. of how it's supposed to work. Right, it's the opposite of market economics. It's more general in the in the car world where I see almost everything is rising, unless you want like a Cavalli Mangusta, in which case, you know, you know, 25 grand and you're good. But with watches, it's just a few models and just a few brands and they're definite losers. There've been some bankruptcies. Um, Interesting. In, entertain me here, because I got to know, I can guess, but I got to know what watches were you looking at that just went <laughs> Um, and nuts maybe isn't a fair word, but I really, oh, it's want nuts. A, I'm in the industry. It's, I not. really want a Vacheron Constantin overseas automatic. And I know you like it in Brown, but I like the blue dial. And this is a watch that I think when I started looking secondhand, I, I think it's Emmett's retails like low twenties or something. Um, I'm seeing people asking right now, high twenties, low thirties, they go like this, um, where did, when did this happen? You know, I called, I called a few Vacheron um, stores a few months ago and I felt like I was talking to Rolex. They, they just kind of chuckled, which watch do you want? Okay, you know, and that, and that was that. So that's, that's one on, on, a, on a larger list, but that's when I was just, I felt like I, I, I was there at the right time and place and I didn't buy it and I should have. <laughs> it's now, I'm just, now I'm just waiting, I guess, or I, I'm trying to decide, do I wait or do I just finally pull the trigger? We'll, we'll see. Gen 2 Vacheron overseas are nice yes. too. You get that with the blue lacquer dial. Very nice watch. Mm -hmm. not, not to be underestimated. Uh, you know, that's part of the challenge, I think, right now. There are a lot of watches that are like that. Not exactly that, but sure. like that. And if, for example, you wanted a Chopard Alpine Eagle 41 with a blue dial, mm -hmm. substantially mm -hmm. a great watch, technically the equal to the Vacheron. But there's no money chasing that right now. You can go into a boutique and buy one. And yeah. It's maybe that, is that the smart money? I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I, it's a good, it's a, it's, it's interesting how it happens, how the, the herd mentality all kind of comes together and these certain, as you said, watches just, just go through the roof. Um, but I really want that Vacheron. That's the problem. That's the one, that's the one I want. <laughs> Pick your guns. That's what I say. I say buy cheap, buy twice, get, get what you really want. Yes, I agree. Same, same with cars, buy what you really want. That's the key. 
Now, there's a little bit of crossover. I think every once in a while you see something flagrant like the Mercedes CLS 55 IWC edition and you get both with the purchase. Uh, why do car guys love watches and vice versa? It seems like 90% love both. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think, I think what's not to love, I mean, both are mechanical objects, right? Uh, to some extent, I mean, modern cars less and less so, but they're mechanical objects. Um, and there's a culture of just, of, of collecting, of getting like, I, I know people just, we like to spend time, like for me, part of the collecting or, or enthusiast process is like the process to like actually hunt down the stuff I like, figure out what I like. And I feel like you can either start with cars or start with watches, but as you become sort of entrenched in that, the allure of like, oh, there's this other thing over here that's not that different that I can kind of get into and do the, follow some of the same pathways, you just, you end up kind of touching both worlds. Um, and for me, it's a mechanical thing. You know, today, I like older cars because I think they're more mechanical. The experience is a little bit more analog. Uh, modern cars are amazing, but they're just not as engaging for me experience-wise. Uh, and with technology everywhere today, I have loved just the idea of a, the simplicity and elegance of like a mechanical watch. I love that there's no battery in here. I truly do. And I find it I find some of that same overlap with cars. Like it just, it, it, it brings me back. It, it brings me back in a way that I think is positive. And I'm sure others are, are feeling, you know, similar ways about this stuff. But I would say almost, yeah, I think nine out of 10 is the right number. Nine out of 10 people overlap into both. It's funny because there are also other parallels in general. You hear some people talk about electric cars the way they talk about quartz. Oh, quartz. <laughs> the, the yeah. Tesla Model S is a quartz car. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. For electronics. Yeah, no, it is interesting. Somebody else was, I, yeah, we were talking about the Ferrari. So I have a Ferrari F430. It's one of my fun cars and it's got the F1 automated gearbox that everyone hates. Um, and somebody was, uh, a friend of mine was, he was talking about how he wears a Breitling quartz watch and people like come up to him and are like, that's not a real Breitling. You know, it's, it's got a quartz inside. And I feel like it's the same thing. People like look into my car and they're like, oh, it's not a manual. Oh, this is like, you know, this is, it's just silly. It's just silly. And I think Electric cars, um, you know, enthusiasts will, will come around, I think, in the end. I mean, some of us may be diehard, you know, engine people, but, uh, you know, cars, cars are really good. The cars that are being made are really good. And I think there's going to be, these manufacturers are smart. They're going to find ways to make really exciting, engaging cars for enthusiasts that are electric or hybrid or, or what have you. So just give it time. Yeah, I agree with that because people forget because it's been so long, no one's still alive to remember it. But there was a time, and this was documented, where around the turn of the 20th century, there were these diatribes against automobiles. They were cold, dead. They had neither yes. heartbeat nor breath. A horse knows its name, responds to its master's <laughs> hand. Who yes. wants to hear this cold, dead metal rattle? And today it's like, oh, the beauty of a V12 or a V8 naturally. Yes. You know, no one's asking for a horse. <laughs> That's true. It moves. I mean, it just moves on. I mean, some of it's generational, right? Like, so that's kind of, you know, muscle cars really peaked, but then they've started to come back down. I've got two little girls, four and six, and, you know, they're going to grow up in an electric car world. That's going to be their, their world. So I'm sure they'll look back at old timers like me who still want the V8, V12. Uh, I just think it's silly. So some, so there's a transit, there's a generational transition that just happens no matter what, but Again, these, these car manufacturers are smart, and I think that you'll see more and more engaging uh, cars, regardless of, of their drivetrain. I would even uh, kind of continue that thread of thought. Like, there was definitely a peak in the value of muscle cars, and I, I want to say it was some, somewhat, not distant past, but we are past it. And I feel mm -hmm. like 10 years ago, muscle cars, 60s and 70s Porsche, Stingray Corvettes, you know, things like that were already established collector items. Are you seeing a generational change as the boomers move out of the market in what's interesting and what's moving? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that's part of almost the hypothesis behind cars and bids. You know, we were trying to build something for these younger demographics. I mean, look at the stuff that, that we sell. Um, it's, it's, it's Miatas, it's, it's M3s of every generation. Um, land cruisers, lots of amazing land cruisers, paying top dollar for low mile land cruisers from the 90s and 2000s. Um, it's, it's that kind of stuff. And I don't think, I think they're, you know, that older generation, those cars just don't really resonate. That's not true. I'm sure, I mean, that's a generalization, but they don't resonate in the same way, maybe, um, you know, muscle cars and things from their younger years 
yours did. So there's, I definitely see a transition. And when you look at uh, the market and the way it's moved, that's exactly right. Muscle cars and those things have started to come back down overall. And these sort of modern classics are just on, on the rise. And I think that trend's gonna carry forward for a, a pretty long time. And we have already seen one rollover in, I guess, a generation of collectors because the guys who fought World War II, you know, the greatest generation, the depression mm -hmm. generation, they grew up with cars like, you know, the, the Stutz Bearcat and the Ford Model A. And for them, that first generation of car collector was driving a Ford Model A to the car club in 1955. Now, right. I mean, there's Model A's are still out there and people still drive them, but they're no longer the heart and soul in the background of the collector car community. Now, I mean, I almost want to say if you were to put together like a collector car lineup for the next five years, it's going to be a six cylinder Land Cruiser, an Integra GSR, an A yes. Supra, an A, an NA Mazda Miata. And that's that's the model yeah. of five years from now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and look at, you know, the car culture's changed too. Like the shows used to be a little bit more formal, I feel like. Uh, maybe they were, you know, uh, happening a little less frequently. Now we're all spoiled. Well, again, COVID's interfered slightly, but we've generally been spoiled um, with cars and coffee at your local show. And it's just a place for just normal people who are enthusiasts for cars to like get together and, and, and you know, geek out over all those exact models. And that's the kind of stuff that you know, we love, we can't wait. We look forward to some cars and bids events and how much fun that will be when it's finally safe to do so, hopefully not too far away. Now, fingers crossed I can make it to that. So pivoting back to uh, watches for a moment. You know, I've long thought it would be great to have something like cars and bids for the watch community, but for what do, yeah, there we go. There's a business idea. Everyone else listening to this, we call dibs. Um, <laughs> It seems difficult to do like auctions on eBay, ultimately, you know, for low value and, you know, fringy vintage watches. But for the most part, the big dollar watches are kind of like submit a bid or buy it now. Now. Yeah. Yeah. You don't see a whole lot of active auctions working in volume other than things that are organized on the calendar by, you know, Phillips mm -hmm. and Sotheby's and Christie's. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see any any challenges maybe in, in why auctions, the way cars and bids work? don't yet work with watches? Are they just too non-standard? I mean, I was wondering, I mean, I wanted to ask you why. I wanted to ask that same question to you basically, which is, it's just to say, I mean, cars, maybe they're a little bit more, I mean, there's, I assume there's fewer of them. I assume the watch market's more liquid um, and there's ways to remotely authenticate stuff. We've got like, you've got like Carfax, you've got history reports. There's, there's more of a standard, you know, obviously if you're doing a watch auction site, I assume you're going to need to be doing verification or ID in-house to support that, but that's, that's doable. Um, I think it's a great idea, but again, the, the market is just so liquid that perhaps there's just not really a need to do it, but I do, I, I, I still, I tinker with this idea in the back of my head all the time because A, it's just so fun. And I just, I wonder, I wonder how the market would react to it, especially for you know, some of the hotter items or the more special or rare items. Uh, it seems like it makes a lot of sense. I know the traditional, you know, the traditional watch auction time period, those are big, those are big events in the watch world, but that's very high dollar stuff. So I don't know, you tell me, Tim, why aren't we, why aren't we doing watches and bids? That's what I want to know. I, I mean, we're not doing it yet. I'll say that. <laughs> okay, okay. For now, I'd say it's a lot of stuff. It's standardization. You mentioned Carfax, you mentioned auto check. Mm -hmm. This is a big deal. Like, can you imagine if there were the equivalent of a 17 digit VIN for every right. watch made since 1981? And every car amazing. made since 81 has that 17 digit VIN. If the car yeah. ever gets painted, if the car ever gets hit, if it gets mangled and it gets a salvage title or a branded title, all these ways we have of tracking a car through the years, um, None of that applies to watches. Could you imagine if an entry would be made on a watches watch facts report? If right, when it was serviced and yeah, yeah, it'd be amazing. Are you kidding me? Values would plummet on this watch, obviously, but yes, it'd be amazing. This watch <laughs> polished in 1984. It was polished again in 1990. <laughs> I see it on, you know, I got the little yeah, guy I right can there. see right here. <laughs> yeah, or the watch was dropped in 2007. You know, all these things that aren't standardized. Uh, and, and there's no standardization of condition. Like we have these terms we use in the car world, the number one Concours, a number yes. two, which is like a number one car that's been driven. A number five is a basket case. Every single watch dealer who's ever listed a watch has listed it as mint. <laughs> I've noticed this. Yes, every watch is apparently never worn, brand new, mint condition, flawless. Uh, yes. Yeah. 
won in a sales contest and never worn. <laughs> you know, there's that. And um, also, I think we, we take it for granted. And I, I'm not always I'm not in favor of greater interference in the car market. But let's be honest, there are a lot of laws and databases and systems yes. and forms that underpin the car market. There right. are it's, it's very regulated. It's a, it's there, a regulated there, industry. Yeah. Those VINs, they're, they're registered at the time of manufacture. There are all sorts of federal laws and state laws about branded titles and mm -hmm. lemon laws, flood cars. Uh, th there's nothing like that to underpin, you know, watches and bids. Not yet. Yeah, that's true. That's why I think to do it right, you would have to have some sort of in-house verification. You're, you're going to have to guarantee stuff. It's, it's, it's a big endeavor. Let me ask you this. Yeah. I got one more question for you, Tim, on, on, on watches and bidding. That's, that's, that's true for non-new stock, right? For, for, used, for used watches. Um, why won't Rolex just let us bid on these watches that are unattainable? Like, that's another question I have. That just seems like it just, it's an opportunity for them and it's an opportunity for the market uh, that I would love, I would love to see. I want to, I just want to see what is this watch really worth when, when it's open to the market, free, free market to bid. You sort of find out because some people put that <laughs> stuff on Chrono 24 a few hours later. The next day. Yeah. yeah they answer, the, yeah. Question, the question is answered. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. Um, I think the main thing is we, we don't sell new watches here at Watchbox, but th what we were talking about you and I just a moment ago, the more verification you have to put into a watch that's being offered at an auction, you wind up just being what we've got at Watchbox, where we buy the watch, we bring it in, yep. we inspect it, and then we offer it. Um, and, and here's the other thing. Like, I think it's much more of like people will buy a car because of all those standards that are in place for everything right down to like Corvette NCRS, like National Corvette Restoration Society, all yes. that stuff, like a Bloomington Gold certificate, it makes people comfortable buying stuff sight unseen at an, in an auction environment. I still feel like in the watch industry, people want to talk to a salesman and exhaustively ask every question until he runs out of questions. It is true that I need to talk to a person factor. Yeah, yeah, which I get, but that's part of, that's one of the things I like about an online auction, right? It's, there's transparency. You get to talk to that seller. The, the, the community is gonna come out. I could only imagine the watch world, watching people come out to explain all the potential flaws and questionable elements of a certain watch. I mean, maybe no seller wants to experience that. I, that I could understand. Um, but that's that's one of the things I think with cars, it's actually helped people trust buying a used car online, oftentimes sight unseen or with remote inspection where you're not you're, you're not seeing it in person. Um, and it is it is relying on the community to help verify and validate and point out uh, potential issues. So now I will tell you, working in a sales environment, you run into some. Let's call them characters. Um, now, for example, selling on eBay, e eBay Motors, selling watches on eBay, it's a very buyer-centric environment, the way the rules mm -hmm. are structured and the mm -hmm. consumer protections are oriented. But in the yeah. world of cars, people commit and then they flake out. Can you tell us a little bit about the challenge of trying to balance the interests of buyers and sellers as sort of the broker currents and bids? Yeah, I mean, we, we view it pretty simply, which is we try to just be as transparent as possible and put as much information out there as possible about a vehicle, um, if anything comes up, we, we, we make sure everyone's aware during the auction to disclose it. We think that helps because really the only time, um, you know, deals struggle or, 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 you know, risk falling apart is when there's just mis mismatched expectations, right? The buyer thought they were getting this and it wasn't quite that, or the seller had an expectation around something with regards to the, you know, the way the transaction was going to, you know, occur. So for us, it's just trying to be as transparent and honest and upfront as possible to support everything to go smoothly, but it, it is a challenge. And we've, you know, we've, some people accuse us of being too um, seller centric. Some people accuse us of being too buyer centric. Uh, we've tried to, we've tried to balance it all out in a way that we think, we think works, but we're always trying to improve at the same time. We're always listening to our customers to think about ways that we can improve. Well, let's talk a little bit about cars and watches again, and the ones you've owned. You know, you're telling me you've got, you've got the 430, um, yeah, and that was like that's a big that's a big move for me because this is you know that was like a dream car essentially a uh, car I've wanted a long time, uh, but sorry go go ahead with your your no question. no no tell me what else is in your garage I gotta know yeah oh my garage is very small I so I I tell people this like when I say I'm I'm an enthusiast what I mean is like I'm not necessarily a collector I like things to come and go I find that especially with cars this is one of the reasons I like watches it's much easier to store watches. Um, 
you know, I only have so much space. I live in Southern California. And so I like to just kind of keep things rotating in or out. Um, you know, prior to the 430, I had an M2 competition, one of the one of the newer ones. That was a great car. I sold on cars and bids. It was a, it was a great experience. Um, I've owned, uh, you know, like some, some Japanese stuff. Nissan 300ZX was my first car. I love that car. Uh, this was the 90s version. Completely disaster. I couldn't afford a good one. It was just a disaster. Uh, but I still love that car. And we've sold some amazing ones on cars and bids. There's a market where that's a car no one cared about for a solid 15 years, maybe 20 years. And now it's starting to come back to life, which is, which is great to see. Um, and, you know, I've owned a bunch of BMWs. That's the other category of cars I've had quite a few of. Uh, I had an E92 M3, the 2008 M3, the V8. Loved that car. Uh, missed that car. Wonder if it'll find its way back into my garage uh, at some point in the future. Uh, and like I mentioned, I have these two young daughters. So right now I'm trying to figure out what's a cool four wheel drive off road, you know, go camping, haul the whole family out. They give me a lot of grief uh, regarding the Ferrari and their inability to ride in it as it only has two seats. So we got to get something that can, that can fit them too. Uh, that's, that's fun to play with on the weekends. Yeah. I'm thinking, uh, I, either F FJ 62 Land Cruiser or, mm -hmm. uh, may, maybe a last of the line Grand Wagoneer. I love, I love the Grand Wagoneers. <laughs> so that's been in the list. I'm always looking. Um, they're all on the East Coast. That's where all the Wagoneers are, but we need some more on the West Coast out here where I am. Um, I also love the Range, like the 90s Range Rover Classic, like those. An automobile that will, will never work. Um, getting to, you know, your destination down the road is, is unlikely. Oh, but it looks so good. I just, I, I, I'm a little obsessed with those, always monitoring that market. So we'll, we'll see what falls into my, into my garage soon. Well, you're back to the future fan. So if you remember, it was there for only a second, but if you're a car guy, you got to remember that Marty McFly's girlfriend, Jenny had a dad driving an AMC Eagle. I, I yes. That. Yes. There you go. That is a good choice. I like that. Okay. So, um, so what watches have you owned? What watches do you currently own? If you're not big yeah. on the current or past, what are the aspirations? I'd like to well, hear that's a good, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it, right now I have like the, the every day I've got the, 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 the recently discontinued um, Explorer 39 Mark II, which I'd like to talk about. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. I was kind of surprised they, and disappointed they discontinued, but I have one, so I guess that's good. 36 is great, but I don't know. I really like the 39. It's an everyday watch. I just love this watch. It's understated, simple. It's, it's good. Were you, were, was there any surprise? Does anyone care that the 39 is gone or is everyone just happy to go back to 36? You know, there was a little bit surprise on my part because I think everyone understood that there was a log jam of three hand, no date, 39 to 41 mm -hmm. millimeter, like kind of entry level Rolex sports watches. The Milgauss, the Oyster Perpetual 41 last year, the 39 millimeter Explorer, the Air King. And on the basis of the Milgauss being the oldest, not redesigned since 2007, I thought, well, certainly they're going to discontinue that. Um, I was a little bit shocked that the 39 millimeter Explorer went away. I was not shocked that the 36 came back because I and a few others had said, I think this is the time, this is the market for a 36 millimeter all arounder. Uh, I yeah. think you've got a great watch. If you've got a Mark II relatively short. I do. Time. Yeah. I love it. It's great. So yeah. And the 36 is great. I was, I was, I was a little surprised. I was hoping to see, I don't know, some more excitement in the Explorer line, but you know, the two tone, I guess. There's your excitement. Uh, if, if, if that's your, that's your bag. It's a little bit too much excitement for me. Um, <laughs> but hey, no diamonds. That's good. That's true. No diamonds. Um, but I also own other watches. Um, you know, I've, one thing I've found is I've, I've learned that I don't like very tall watches. Like depth matters to me. So I've owned quite a few. I keep trying to like get Omegas and Tags. And every time I just am not, they're just a little too thick for me. So they're, they're gone. Um, the first real, you know, just a few years ago, mechanical kind of Swiss watch I got was an Aura Cyber 65 bronze bezel. Uh, and I just, I love that watch. That's been with me on a, a million trips to, you know, a bunch of different beaches. Um, I don't dive, I just snorkel, but it's in the water a lot. I love that watch. Uh, and I've got a few little like vintage pieces. I find vintage is just fun to just like buy. So I buy, I buy vintage on a whim, which is both good and bad, I found. Um, but some of my winners, I guess I would say, um, I've got like a Wittenauer just uh, skin diver from like the 60s that I really like, uh, which is a fun, cool watch. It's got the steel bezel. So it's got kind of a explorer-ish vibe in terms of that steel bezel. I like that. And then um, I have a, uh, my dress watch is, which I'd never wear, 
now especially there's just there's absolutely no reason to wear a dress watch um it's it's like an omega pre-speed master like 1950s it's it's like a jumbo with like the bumper automatic right so instead of a free spinning rotor i, I guess like automatic it. cool. I like it's got it. the bumper you know it's cool and you and you, yes you feel it but you know i i like that so you know i've got a i've got a budding collection and a few more little things there but i'm always i'm getting ready to kind of like move up i'm like i purposefully hold back you know, I'm like, I've got a lifetime to enjoy uh, collecting stuff, watches, cars, what have you. Yeah, you don't need to jump right to the peak. At least that's not my approach. So I'm just working my, I'm just working my way up. But I really do want to get a Vacheron Constant Overseas Automatic Gen 2, Blue Lacquer Dial. That's what I want. Brown Dial is great too. I've never seen it in person. I would like to see that watch. Um, and then also on the list, I mean, it could be a pretty long list. A watch I really toyed with that I, I, I'm always thinking about back to kind of thin wide watches is the uh, Bulgari Optima Finissimo, just titanium, you know, just sort of like, it's almost like a strap versus a, a watch. That's a, that's a cool watch that I, and there's a watch that isn't going up in value. So maybe that's a, a place, a place to look. And then I'm always trying to get Rolex watches that I can never get. Uh, I really like the Everose Yachtmaster Oyster Flex. The Oyster Flex, wa Oyster Flex watches, I just generally, I really dig the look, the style. My Diver 65 is on a rubber band. Uh, and so I would love to get my hands on one of those. Although the Oyster Flex has sizes apparently. So buying it. Yes, yes. See, this is, this is something I learned probably from you uh, in one of your many videos. Is it, it, it needs to be sized. It needs to be the correct size. And so I really want to get that one from you know, uh, Rolex if I can, so I can get the correct size. Because I have no idea you know, what the sizes are, how that works. It's a little bit easier if you buy the 42 millimeter because it's got a glide lock system versus just a, an easy link. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful watch. It's not the one. Not the one no, no, no. I'm, I'm yeah. all for getting what you want first. And because I often say, you know, buy cheap, buy twice, but also if you buy your second choice, you're going to wind up with that and your first choice at some point in the future. Yeah. <laughs> that is very true. Tim, what about you? I do, you know, you get, so I'm jealous in that in your field, you get to, you know, try on and experience sort of the merchandise. Oh, I yeah. just have to look at all the cars, you know, on the site, like everybody else. What, what excites you about watches these days? Like what, <laughs> how many watches have you worn on your wrist? All of them? Honestly, I, I, I'm, it's almost like I'm a car journalist, like where you're like, oh, we're doing another Pagani event today. I yeah. never, I never get, burned out on them because I look for variety. Like right here, I mean, I've got a million dollars worth of watches in oh, the room wow. today. Ulysse Norden, Freak, Blue mm, Cruiser, beautiful. Carousel, Seven Day Power Reserve, White Gold, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, for me, I think it's, it's the adventure of discovery. If you can imagine, you know, if you can imagine being the guy who judges the Pebble Beach Concorde d'Elegance, you might not own any of those cars, but if you know where every sticker is supposed to be mm. on you know, an interwar Bentley eight liter, you know, you've got an entirely different kind of, of acquisition going, you're acquiring knowledge. And the more you acquire, the more of an authority you become in that world. And so without actually owning everything at the same time, the, the stature and the status comes from, from expertise. And for me, I, in, you know, ingrain myself more deeply in the watch community and I satisfy myself and, and still experience an adventure through discovering this stuff and experiencing what I haven't. But I still, I still love watches. Make no mistake. There's still a list. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a boot, you know, I'm not a Buddhist monk here. I still like. Right. Them. No. Yeah, of course. Uh, and that, that, that makes sense. I mean, you're, you're absolutely, your knowledge is just unrivaled. I'm a huge fan. I, you know, I've watched too many of your videos to describe uh, or to admit to. Uh, do you ever get to like, you know, taking the inventory out for a little while or is there any sort of like within Watchbox, are you guys allowed to like kind of, you know, yeah. I would say I get a great employee pricing deal, but beyond that, I've actually, uh, there've been a couple of times when manufacturers have sent me watches where it's mm -hmm. basically, you know, it's basically getting the 4,000 mile Dodge Viper test car that you know has been through exactly a 16,000 quarter mile tests. Yes. And so, you know, I, I get to wear these manufacturer uh, samples and I take them out. I have fun with them. I remember I wore a Devon Tread one year for Halloween. That was a piece that they sent to me. Uh, it was the one that Robert Downey uh, 
war in the Avengers movies, the one F. Oh, that's cool. That I loved it to pieces. Um, you know, I've, I've had a chance to wear stuff around the office because, you know, when it's a Patek Philippe 5016 with a tourbillon and a minute repeater and a perpetual calendar, uh, you're Just not- leave it on the wrist for a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Wear it around, live the life, but, you know, <laughs> don't necessarily walk home with it at night. It's probably not <laughs> the best idea. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's that's probably not the best idea. That's cool. I'm that that I'm envious of. I would love to get to just drive and sample all the cars that are on our site, but it's just not possible, unfortunately. That is the advantage. I'm I'm lucky. I work for a company that's in every global market with like a physical store in all those markets. But I also work at the headquarters where all that stuff comes back. So mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like I'm I'm robbing the world and putting it on my wrist. Um, you know, I, I feel like a pirate. I've got so much treasure in here. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds fun. I mean, it's, it sounds like you found a good a good gig for yourself. That's cool. when are you going to come visit me? You're West Coast, right? Yeah, I'm West Coast. Let COVID's, you know, what's coming down. You tell me if you're ever out here. And but I'd love to. I'd love to. Are you kidding? I'd love to be in the treasure chest. That has sounds anyone, fantastic. Has anyone ever set a reverse cannonball run? <laughs> you know. I don't think so, at I've least not in modern it. times, but it could, we could start it. I mean, it could happen now. There, there we go. Maybe we'll do a cooperative cannonball run. You know, you leave from LA, I'll leave from the Red Ball garage. We'll meet somewhere in Ohio. <laughs> we'll see, yeah, in the middle of nowhere. All right. Good stuff. Blake, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to sign off now. Guys, remember, uh, if you want to check out more from Blake, go to Cars and Bids, participate, bid if you like, enjoy, read, geek out. So for now, time out, Tim out, Blake out, and thanks for logging on. Thanks, Tim.